polygon lives in the plane and has vertices in our lattice, which is just in the plane, going to be something isomorphically squared. And we like to call this plane N. N stands for fan. And you can say that a lattice polygon is Fano if the only lattice point that's strictly in the interior is the origin itself. I mean, I suppose you could take a lattice polygon that had some other lattice points certainly in the interior, but then you might as well just change coordinates and put the interior as the individual lattice poly. Okay. And then if you wanted to write down how to make a Fano polygon, well, you could list the vertices, and here are the vertices. And um, if you were like a calculus student, I would totally try to drag you through this. If you were like talking to someone and for some reason you didn't like listing points, and it just made you really, really angry to write down points, but you wanted to tell someone else how to make this polygon. Uh, well, you could force them to tell you all the equations of the lines, and that then when you graphed all of the three lines that give you the edges of this triangle, that would be another way to draw the triangle. You could just color in the inside the bounded piece of those lines. So if you do that, you have some amount of choice just because everybody learns on like middle school algebra class, there are lots of ways to write the equation of a line. And the, norma the normalization condition we've taken here is that some number times x plus some number times y equals negative 1. The nice reason to normalize with negative 1 is that if you convert all of these equalities for the edge equations to an inequality with a greater than or equal to sign, the interior points of this triangle are precisely the ones that satisfy the system with, of inequalities with greater than or equal to. there we are. We made a polygon. But we won't really want to have two polygons, so we need another place to draw another polygon. And we'll just take the dual lattice, which is also another copy of z squared, and then we get another plane in which our dual lattice lives. And there's a natural pairing because it is a dual lattice between points in, in the plane we started with and points in our new plane. So if we do that, we can define a new polygon and it's going to be the set of all points that dot with points in our original polygon and give us at least negative one. So if we work that out for our example triangle that we had, well, we can dot, we can just rewrite all of our edge equations that we had. We wrote them as something times x plus something times y equals negative one, but that's just a dot product in disguise. So we can rewrite it as a dot product, just read off the coefficients in our edge equations. And then once, once we've done that, we have this obvious set of points we have. So if we, we graph those points, we get a new polygon. Okay. So here we are, we've got a new triangle. This is a very nice triangle. It still has its vertices at lattice points. But if you care about lattice information, this is definitely not the same triangle that we started with. We started with a, a triangle that only had three boundary lattice points plus the origin, and now this one has lots more. We've got a new triangle, it's got lots more lattice points. And we have a set of observations, namely we started with something that was a Fano polygon, we went through this duality procedure, we got a new thing that was also a Fano polygon. And in fact, that's a general property. If you start with a Fano polygon and you run this polar duality procedure, you're going to get a new thing that is also a lattice polygon. So there was no, um, you know, in general, if I try to write down the equations for the edge equations of some polygon, I'm not guaranteed to be able to normalize with the right-hand side being negative 1 and the left-hand side being integers. But if you start with a Fano polygon, that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to have integer expressions for your edge equations. That means that when you do the polar duality procedure, you get out a new lattice polygon, which also happens to be a Fano polygon. And then this polar construction has a nice duality to it, so if you take the polar to the polar, you get back where you started, and you have something that, that really is a dual pair combinatorially. It's useful to remember that this also generalizes your sort of standard combinatorial duality on polygons or polytopes, in the sense that if I write down a dot for each edge of my starting polygon and connect those dots, I'll get something that has the same number of edges and the same number of faces as my polar polygon. It's just that here I put it all into coordinatize and coordinatize the, same, the whole thing. All right. So just a little bit of vocabulary. We've, we've got this duality procedure. It's almost like a reflection in a mirror. 
So we say that our starting polygon and its polar dual are reflexive polygons. And sometimes it's nice to also say that they're a mirror pair, because we like the word mirror. Okay. So here we are. Here's our beautiful, beautiful, beautiful mirror pair of triangles. And there's this cute little uh, relationship that they have if you count up the lattice points on the boundary. So there's three points on the boundary here. There's, some of them are drawn a little smaller so they're hard to see, but like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lattice points strictly on the boundary here. Three plus nine is 12, still. Uh, but in fact, you can classify all of the Fano polygons up to an overall change of coordinates that preserve your underlying lattice. And you'll get 16 isomorphism classes. And I, yeah, so here's the picture. Some of, some of the Fano polygons, when you do the polar duality, they're self-dual, so that's incorporated in the picture. And you can play that same game with counting up the boundary lattice points on each side and adding them up. Um, and you would get 12 in every case. This is true actually for all kinds of really intense deep reasons. There's a cool paper that came out of the monthly by Poonin and Rodriguez Vegas uh, that explains that sort of magic number 12 from the boundary last points on all sides from all sorts of perspectives, including the perspective of like modular forms. And this is already, even with polygons, a very crazy, neat set of results. The other thing to say is I stole this from a physics paper by this guy named Paul Prozitti who made all of these nice tables of things like elliptic vibrations and so on and so forth uh, coming out of uh, toric data. So, so far we've been mostly in polygons. Now we should go up dimensions. Right? So I should tell you what I even mean by polytope. I just want to take the convex hull of a finite set, set of points, typically I'll think of these points as my vertices, so I suppose you can do something really dull and like not put your points you want to start with in general position. And then you can uh, generalize all this stuff, we can make a lattice polytopy a polytope with integer coordinates, and we can generalize our polar duality construction just by instead of working in two dimensions, now we can work in case. So again, you can start with a polytope, you can write down, now you would write down the equations for the facets, the hyperplanes that bound your polytope. Uh, you can normalize to have the right-hand side of your facet equations be negative one, you can read off a new point, and again, you can check whether that new polytope that you get is a lattice polytope. If, you, if so, you say that your pair of lattice polytopes are reflexive and that they make up a mirror pair. So here's the one-dimensional reflexive polytopes. It's kind of, kind of nice to have that floating around, just in case you want to do a really small example. Uh, and here's a three-dimensional pair of lattice polytopes. You can see uh, on this side we don't have as many lattice points, only the vertices are lattice points. And on this side we have lots more lattice points. There is one thing that I have to tell you just because of the way I set it up. In two dimensions, the condition of only having one lattice point in the interior, which we call Fano, is identical to the, to the reflexivity condition that comes out of polar duality. Once you go past two dimensions, those uh, conditions are a little bit different. Every reflexive polytope will have the properties of having a unique, strictly interior lattice point. But there are some polytopes that have that property but are not reflexive. And this sort of truncated cube thing that I've drawn for you is the standard example of a polytope that has a, only a single interior point but isn't a reflexive thing. And the way you would figure that out is you would just write down the equation for this truncated triangle and just notice that it has some one halves in it, which is no good. You can classify a reflexive polytope. As I was saying at lunch the other day, I got really good at reciting the numbers in this table. Uh, so 1, 16, 4,319. We have databases of all of these polytopes that ship with Sage. I mean, I guess I don't know if you can call the database of one-dimensional polytopes, but. You can. <laughs> um, 
And then there is also a database of the four-dimensional polyhooks that was originally worked out by a couple of physicists, and which I think is now incorporated in SAFE when maybe you have to call an optional package or something. It's the largest it's a huge package. package. Yeah. It's a separate category. <laughs> right. Um, so if you really, for some reason, want to look at all 473 some million reflexive polytopes, and look for some things, you can ask, you can install that package, and you can play with them. And about five dimensions and above, this is an open problem. There are some special classes of reflexive polytopes that have been classified in much higher dimensions, um, like all the smooth phonos, which I think are not yet in stage. Um, but the general problem is maybe just too much of a combinatorial explosion to actually hope for a full classification. Do you know more or less how many? Is there an estimate for the order of magnitude or how it grows? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you could certainly take the data that people have on classification of smooth bottoms as a lower bound. Um, so there is an estimate of for the growth, which I think is empirical and sort of fitting for these numbers into some exponential uh, growth. Uh, so for 5, it's uh, 10 to the 18 or so. And in general, it's 10 to the power 4, or maybe 2 to the dimension plus 1, something like that. I mean, there's also this theorem that any lattice polytope will occur as a face of some higher dimensional reflexive polytope. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it's as bad as it can be, right? It might be hopeless to do I mean, is it singly exponential? Is it like? Some, something to the power n squared, something to the power n, that's not clear. So I think it is uh, 10 to the power 2 to the power dimension with some extra shit. So it's w There's a lower bound that says that? Uh, no, it's uh, just an empirical observation that fits this data very well. Well, for four <laughs> points, <laughs> that's not very good. <laughs> There's also some people that have computed some of the five dimensions and Mm -hmm. Then, as from how far you get in the computation, you can help estimate how many there will be, and that was that also supports that number. So, um, there's, a, there's like four and a half data points. Yeah, there are estimates also based on uh, trying to statistically determine how often do you get uh, self dual polytops, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, there's goes to some samples. Mm -hmm. So the bottom like line, I guess, is that even for five dimensions, it's very unlikely that we'll ever have a full list, uh, so definitely not for five dimensions. Well, okay, I made a complaint about this yesterday. If you look at the maximal ones, are you, are you about to say this? Uh, uh, no, I'm not about to say this. So if you look at, so maximal means it's not properly contained in another reflexive point. So if you look at the maximal ones, then there's only three in dimension two and 40 in dimension. I mean, it's much, much less. Yeah. And so, really, you should think about an incidence relation too, where one is contained in another, as it gives you a coset, or you know, and you just uh, it, you, there's like some huge disastrous combinatorial thing, and then like a few sprinkled maximal vertices, and that I think we could classify in much higher dimensions. Right, um, and, and as I was saying yesterday, I think this is related to the classification of smooth phonos. So the smooth phonos have only simplices as their faces. So it's in some, it may be in some way dual to the maximality property or related to the dual to the maximality property because they're sort of, sort of some of the smallest reflexive polytopes you can get. And for those, an algorithm to generate them is known in any dimension. And people have made lists, I think, at least up through dimension 11 and maybe more when I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, so to generate all of them, you just like start plucking vertices away. And then you do have to test for isomorphism, but it's sort of like you could, in principle, enumerate all of them if you someone put a gun to your head without having to like, store them all or something horrible. So I right, I mean, I think that is the philosophy that was used to get this 473 million. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you can classify them. Why would you want to classify them? Well, I think once upon a time, the hope was that perhaps if we had this giant list of Kalabi L's, that we're, I'm going to tell you how to get out of uh, reflexive polytopes, you could actually find, like, the Kalabi Yao, that would be the extra dimensions of our universe. Uh, but that proved to be a not terribly realistic ambition. Um, right. So let's, let's just say, how is this going to work? We're going to start with a pair of polytopes. 
we're going to get from them a pair of toric varieties which are related in some way based on the polytope information. And then inside those toric varieties, we're going to get families of hypersurfaces. And those will be mirror families of hypersurfaces in some sense. And whenever you talk about toric geometry, there's just like, you have to spend three pages of your paper doing notation. Uh, and so I guess I have to spend a couple of slides doing toric geometry and notation. Uh, so what do we start with? Um, we start with cones, which are built out of non-negative linear combinations of some set of lattice vectors. And we want to start with cones that don't contain lines through the origin. And then you can glue your cones together to make a fan the same way that you would glue a bunch of simplices together to make a simplicial complex. So we want any face of a cone in our fan to, act to also be in our list of cones in the fan. And then any pair of cones should intersect in a common face. So maybe that common face will just be the origin, or maybe that common face will have more pieces. And a technical condition that one often wants is we say that a fan is simplicial if the generators of each cone in the fan are linearly independent over the real numbers. Uh, you can also write down a condition to make your fan smooth, which would correspond to smooth varieties. Uh, simplicial is a little bit weaker than, than that condition, and it gives you something that looks more or less like an orbital. So this is often the sort of right practical mix of conditions. Now, if, if you want to start with a polytope and get a fan, there are a bunch of different things you can do. I think the easiest one to draw is to start with your polytope and then draw a ray through each vertex of your polytope and then have the top dimensional cones in your, poly in your fan correspond to the facets, the top dimensional uh, hyperplane pieces of your polytope. If you play the game that way, then you end up corresponding to this triangle, for instance, I would get this fan on the right. Okay. Uh, but sometimes when you build a fan like that, you don't have the nice fan properties that you might want. Uh, you might, for instance, have started with some three-dimensional polytope that had faces looking like squares, and then each of your um, top dimensional cones would have four generators and that would fa fail the simplicial con connection because there's no way that four things in three dimensions can be linearly independent over R. So maybe you would want to m make a slightly better fan and slightly nicer fan conditions. And so often what people do in that case is they say, oh, let's throw in some other lattice points. So throwing in some other lattice points in the fan over this triangle here doesn't do anything because there are no other lattice points. They were all the vertices. But I could also work with, say, this triangle and throw in other lattice points here, and then that would give me a more complicated fan than just the fan over the vertices. For instance, there would be a new uh, ray here, a new ray out along the x-axis, and so on. Yeah. And then very often in, in, in the literature, people use a slightly different construction where instead of just drawing the fan over the faces of the polytope, they look at each vertex of a polytope, and they look for the points that are perpendicular to the polytope at that vertex. So for instance, um, at this left hand, sort of bottom left hand corner of my bottom left hand triangle, I can go perpendicular to the bottom edge and just go straight up, and I can go perpendicular to the left hand edge and just go straight over to the right. And so that would give me a cone that looks like this sigma knot cone here. And if I play the same kind of perpendicularity game, so perpendicular to this edge here goes down like that, perpendicular to this bottom edge goes straight up. And so that would give me the cone sigma 1, and so on. If, if you spend all of your life working with reflexive polytopes, you can do things either way because the fan over the faces on one side has the polar duality condition where it's a dual to the normal fan on the other side. So if everything in your life is a reflexive polytope, you can just pick whichever of these two fan constructions you find easier to visualize. 
if things in your life are not always reflective polygons, you have to be a little bit more careful because there may be some overall scaling you need to do to force things to, to have appropriate lattice point generators. So the usual um, condition that you see in most Torah varieties literature is to, is to work with the normal fan. I personally was raised in reflective polytope, so, so I tend to be lazy and think of the, of the fan of the faces because I can draw it. But today's will do things either way for you. And then there are various constructions of toric varieties. Toric varieties generalize the idea of projective space, and most people have two ways to think about projective space. You can think of making projective space by starting with C to the N, throwing away the origin, and then doing an overall group uh, identification on the pieces that remain. Or you can think of making projective space as having these several different coordinate patches and putting your coordinate patches together. Similarly with toric varieties, you can uh, do things, at least for a sufficiently nice toric variety, either way as some sort of quotient where you start with some C to the end, throw away some stuff, and mod out by some group action. Or you can write down data in the fan that lets you make a bunch of coordinate patches and then explain how to glue things together. I think it's easier to do the quotient. So assuming that we have a fan that is a complete fan, it lives in Rn and every point in Rn belongs to some cone in the fan, we can do the quotient. Okay. So if we draw a fan and it's a complete fan, it's typically going to have many more one-dimensional cones, many more rays in our fan, then you would have um, generators for Rn, because they need more. Like here, for instance, is a fan in 2D, and it has three one-dimensional generators. Okay. And then we're going to build our toric variety by throwing, by taking C to the Q, thro throwing away some piece of C to the Q, and then modding out by a subgroup of the complex torus C star. And we'll get some coordinates which have a bunch of overlap. And every one dimensional cone will correspond to some coordinate on our new toric variety. Okay. So this is one of those things that really you have to work out a couple of examples for yourself, but I can at least give you the big picture. Uh, the stuff that you throw away, uh, you are going to look for the subsets of your one dimensional cones that don't make a full cone in your fan and set those coordinates to zero and throw things away. Uh, so for instance, in, in this fan here, the only subset of one-dimensional cones that don't span um, a full cone in my fan would be if I took all three one-dimensional cones. Because there's no cone to span by the, this here and the one going up and the one going down to the left. And so the only thing that I would be throwing away would be setting all of my coordinates to zero. And then um, if we want to know what is our group that's identifying, um, what you do is, um, well, we've got C star to the Q. We want to map C star to the Q into C star to the N, where N is the dimension of the vector space that our fan lives in. And we can do that by multiplying points, because of course C star is a multiplicative group, using the data that's given by the various vertices that we have. So we have some kind of map C from C star to the Q to C star to the N, and we're going to mod out by the kernel of this map which generically is going to look like C star raised to the Q minus N power, and then maybe product with some Mendelian group, which is generated by some primitive roots of unity. One of the things that we were, we've been talking about at this conference is what if you don't work over C star, what if you work over, say, some finite field, then how fussy do you have to be about whether or not these uh, roots of unity actually exist in whatever field you happen to be working over. So here's a really small toric varieties example. Um, the 1D polytope. If I take the fan of the, that you get by taking cones over the faces, well, I get two one-dimensional cones. There's the ray that goes right, and there's the ray that goes left. 
And then the points that I throw away are just zero, zero, because I, I only have one dimensional cones. I don't have any two dimensional cones. And so I'm going to throw away zero, zero. And if you work out the identification that you get, you have, um, let's see, here I, I'm working, my n is 1. I have two one-dimensional cones, so my q is 2. So I'm modding out by um, c star to the 2 minus 1. I don't have any abelian group to worry about in this situation. So what I end up with, in fact, is just z1, z2 is equivalent to lambda times z1, lambda times z2. And my total variety looks like p1. Here's a slightly more complicated example. If you start with this diamond and you build the torque variety corresponding to this diamond, well, you end up throwing away two different types of points, either points where the first two coordinates are zero or points where the second two coordinates are zero. So I'm not allowed to have my first two coordinates be simultaneously zero. I'm not allowed to have my second two coordinates being simultaneously zero. I'm actually modding out by um, C star squared, and the variety that I get is P1 prime P1. So here this is a two-dimensional toric variety, but at the coordinates that I'm using are sort of overkill. I have four coordinates to describe my two-dimensional toric variety. And in general, you might have even more overkill. I mean, it wouldn't be astonishing to be describing, say, a, a three-dimensional toric variety where you had 30 of these homogeneous. Anything anyone wants to ask me about polytope stuff? All right. So I want to build hypersurfaces, and because I'm interested in specifically Kalabi out, I want to build anti canonical hypersurfaces. So I'm going to use a slightly different trick for going and getting a hypersurface in my torque variety from what other people in this conference have been doing. I'm going to use the monomial, uh, the lattice points in my polar uh, dual. Each lattice point will correspond to a um, different monomial in my polynomial. But the powers that I'm going to take are going to be given by dotting the lattice point corresponding with my homogeneous coordinates variable dotting that with my monomial, and then adding an overall one, which the, the adding one is just a normalization that gives you a, a, a homogeneous polynomial instead of a Laurent polynomial with some negative one terms. So you're assuming you have a reflexive polytope? Right, uh, yeah. I'm definitely assuming here that I've got a reflexive polytope so I can play this game. And I, this gives me essentially um, lower powers. So for instance, if I want to take cortex in P3, this construction will do it just starting with a pair of, of reflexive polytopes. I, I, I'm not dilating to get cortex. I'm just starting here and raising to some powers and keeping track that way. My motivation being that I really specifically want to pull out the anti-canonical hypersurface. I don't want to work. So for a cortex in P3, I really do want to work with O4, not O1. And then the alpha m's here, I'm just picking some generic coefficient for every monomial and adding them up and getting a whole family of polynomials potentially that way. All right, so if we do have a pair of reflexive polytopes, and if we take the fan over the faces of one, and we use this uh, expression for polynomials that we had on the previous slide, we'll get the anti-canonical hypersurfaces in this torque variety, and we've carefully chosen the torque variety and the polynomial in such and such a way that it'll actually be Calabi Yau. Uh, I'm saying Calabi Yau variety here because it's possible that the torque variety that you built had some sort of singularity, and then your hypersurface will inherit those singularities. Now, if you work in the appropriate dimensions, you can do an appropriate refinement of your fan where you throw in all the extra lattice points that you could possibly throw in and you make sure your fan is simplicial and then your variety will have very nice singularities or ambient variety 
and the clavio man manifolds inside it will be generically smooth. So it really, in that sense, when you've done all of those resolutions, makes sense to talk about clavio manifolds and not clavio varieties. Uh, this is a little bit fussy. The dimensional gain works out as long as your reflexive polytope is dimension four or lower. So in particular, uh, you can start with four-dimensional reflexive polytopes and get paired families of Columbia threefolds, which is sort of the most important set of physical examples. You're trying to build a bunch of physics theories. Uh, and you can use three-dimensional reflexive polytopes to get K3 surfaces, which I have played with a lot, and two-dimensional to get elliptic curves and so on. Uh, if you want to go up to five-dimensional reflexive polytopes, you can do that, but you have to be fussier about smoothness. And then, because the polar of the polar is the original polytope, if you change your idea about what you think is your starting reflexive polytope and with what you think is your reflexive polytope that gives you monomials, and just swap everything over, you'll get a different family of Calabio hypersurfaces that live in some other variety. And I claim that those paired families of hypersurfaces are mirror. Um, in particular, they have some nice relationships between their um, Hodge numbers. So let me show you just sort of where the Hodge number count would come from. If we have a non-zero lattice point in our uh, polytope, we can think of that as giving us a divisor where we just set the corresponding coordinate equal to zero. Here I'm imagining taking the fan over the faces of my polytope. And then if I intersect those divisors with my with my hypersurface, I'm going to get some divisor in my variety. Right? So I can, I can get a whole long list of things that live in H11 of my variety. Now, I'm not necessarily guaranteed that these are all going to be independent elements of cohomology. They might have some kind of relation. I am also not guaranteed, well, there are certain divisors that you get from lattice points that just, for a general hypersurface, is going to miss the hypersurface. This has, if you think carefully about blowing up, about what the actual throwing in new lattice points to our fan actually means, it turns out that certain lattice points, it just, it just looks like you blew up your ambient variety at a point, and generically your hypersurface would have missed that point. And then the other thing that might happen is you might have something wiggly where your hypersurface was moving around a lot, and so when you intersected it, with your coordinate, it wouldn't just intersect once, it would intersect a bunch of times. And then it would split into a bunch of coordinate components. So all of these things are things that can happen, but you can account for them and sort of count up, well, how many pieces of my H11 do I actually get? And you can write down a formula. So this is a formula for the Hodge number H11 of my hypersurface in my toric variety um, using only data that comes from lattice point counting information in my polytope. And there is a dimensional restriction here on the dimension of the polytope. Um, the problem is that specifically when you work with K3 surfaces, um, well, I mean, you know what H11 is for a K3 surface. It's going to be the same. But, but this formula works in particular very, very well for three folds. So we've got this lovely formula with all these different co-dimension co faces. Uh, and it's basically like, well, we count up all our lattice points in our polytope, but then we have to subtract one because one of them was the origin, and we've got some overall relation just due to our dimension. And then we subtract out the piece for the interior points of the facets, because we knew, know that those generically didn't intersect our hypersurface. And then we add on some extra term that counts whether or not we had any intersections that split into several different components. OK. But you can also count the complex moduli of your hypersurfaces. And it's easy to see that this should have something to do with lattice points in your polar polytope because we defined our hypersurface using monomials where there was one monomial in our equation for our hypersurface for every single lattice point in our polar polytope. 
So it makes sense that the complex moduli would have at least something to do with that count. And, but then maybe, you, you know, maybe you get some isomorphism, maybe there's some overall dependence. You can't just deform in every single monomial direction and have a real moduli space there. Um, so, so you've got to do some counting and you've got to be a little bit careful. And then if we compare these two formulas that we had, they look awfully similar. So here's the formula for counting Taylor moduli. Here's the formula for counting complex moduli. And these formulas look almost identical, except we swapped the roles of what was the polytope and what was the polar polytope. And then, of course, the polar uh, of the polar is the polytope that you started with. So we could also count Taylor moduli and complex moduli for the hypersurfaces in our, on our other side. And these formulas are very really similar. So this is one way to think about what you might mean by having a mirror pair of varieties. Uh, you've got this matching on Hodge numbers. So H11 on one side is uh, HD minus 1, 1 on the other side, where D is the dimension of your globby now, so it's 1 less than the dimension of your polytope. And here's the classic example. It's the one that if you came to our talk, you saw as a, something like a green cluster for quintics. I, I can't draw a four-dimensional polytope very well, but you can think of taking this two-dimensional picture and extrapolating. If you do that, you get a pair of polytopes. One's a simplex, one's a sort of simplex with lots of lattice points. And you can work out what the H11 equation is, and you can work out what the H21 equation is. So on one side you get one, on one side you get 101. And you can put that into the Hodge diamond for a Calabia threefold, and you get this beautiful mirror relationship, right? So one's on one side, one, 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 one. one. Your symmetry is so pretty. Sorry? Even the numbers themselves are very symmetric. <laughs> yes. In fact, with 101s, it's particularly nice, right? I mean, this is just such a pretty little picture. We could, like, you know, get them to interact into the tiles outside or something. Do folks have questions here? So I should say the, the frustrating thing about this procedure, many, many things about it are very, very nice. Right? I mean, you can you could do so much just knowing combinatorics, and you can make your computer do combinatorics for you, and you just have all of this power. What you don't have is specific mirror pairs of varieties, necessarily. We have mirror families. We know that the moduli of one family are related to the moduli of the other family. But if I grab some threefold that's over on this side, and I say to you, what is the Calabia threefold that is specifically the mirror to this threefold that I happen to grab for you? This construction won't do that. It tells you about a relationship between families, but it doesn't necessarily tell you about a relationship between individual threefolds. What's the definition of the mirror then? Um, so there are so, so many definitions of mirror depending on um, who you're talking to. Um, Mathematicians of like. Right. Um, so <coughs> in this context, what you've got is you've got mirror families, and um, you've got a local uh, isomorphism between um, moduli space of complex, uh, complex moduli space on one side and killer moduli space on the other side. And if you solve some Picard Fuchs equations, you can write down explicitly what that isomorphism ought to be in terms of uh, solutions to some Picard Fuchs equations. Maybe we should uh, mention that Kayla was less very naively real and so it's complex. So yeah. It's right, so, so yeah, we have to complexify our killer space. Yeah. Well, are you just saying there's like a local isomorphism of the local moduli spaces? Is that is that all there is to the definition? I thought there was more to it than somehow you had like some a model something and a B model something and things had to be forward. Right, right. So if I'm a physicist, I should say that the A model on one side is the same as the B model on the other side and there are all these physical uh, sure. implications, but, right? But I mean, just saying that 
you know, the scalar moduli on one side or the complex moduli on the other side. Well, I mean, some local, you know, you get some local moduli space, and that's that's not a fine enough invariant, right? I mean, a local space is just it's just going to be some kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, differentiable or see analytic manifold near there, and all analytic manifolds are going to look essentially the same. I mean, if you're not kind of like, what's the What's right, but, but we, have, we have the extra information of the mirror map, right? What's, what is the mirror map? Um, we can take the Picard Fuchs equations, satisfy on this side, and, and okay. write down an explicit map in terms of solutions to those equations. Um, and I mean, you can, you can give many, many more and more rich definitions of mirror symmetry, right? So we can talk, start talking exactly about like derived categories of coherent sheaves and things. Sure, but, but so, okay, so you. So no, no, I'm just trying to pin yeah. down exactly what it means because I can't seem to find an exact sort of, you know, that. I mean, so okay, write down Picard Fuchs equations for one side, and mm -hmm. what does this part, the solutions correspond to what exactly? Um, so you can use the solutions to define a parameter around certain points in your moduli space that have maximally unipotent monodromy, and you can write down a map in terms of expansions of the parameter, okay. which gets you to a specific point in the moduli space on the other side. Okay. But that doesn't sound very economical, right? Doesn't that involve choice, then? Defining the map? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to have a family that has maximally uniform monotony. You need a family to define the map, you say. You can't just say, if I've got this toric calorial here, then its mirror should, sim should satisfy this list of five axioms compared to the... You're using Picard Fuchs, so you're using a deformation. Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are different formulations of, mm -hmm. of what mirror symmetry is. And that was precisely the point I was trying to make, is that this particular formulation is a very family-dependent formulation. And the picard fuchs equations are always for one-dimensional base, or what are they? No, no, we, you can, you we could have many parameters. I mean, typically we expect that on one side we'll have lots of complex parameters and few Kähler parameters, and then on the other side we'll have lots of Kähler parameters and few complex parameters. If you're computationally strong, then you can do this for 101 parameters. <laughs> Has anybody ever done this? Mm, no, I think that's not another thing. Do you want to do a power series, multivariate power series in Canada and not very well. <laughs> So you're saying basically, let's say, so, I mean, since it's family dependent, what you what you do is sort of write down uh, two sort of families which are supposed to be, you know, uh, related by mirror symmetry. And then, and then the question you're asking is, well, there's some there's some map that takes the Cartouche equations and takes a solution and gives local parameters over here. In terms of that map, I mean, what's the what's the corresponding Calabria to this Calabria? Yeah, to to particular points, what are the, what are the right? Points? Yeah. And I mean, I didn't even say the words grow off Whitney theory, which I should also say, right? You can write down curve counts on one side in terms of some parameters. I was I was expecting you to say something like their point counts are the same, so that, that doesn't make any sense if you have a complex value of the parameter. But if you take a rational one, then why why isn't a why can't you match up elements of the mirror by looking at the L function, the Hausnay L function, counting points on either side up to some trivial factors? Wouldn't that give you a canonical mirror? Maybe. I don't think anybody's ever proved. <laughs> for any example. Right? Well, what about the elliptic curves? Start with start easy. So there, the mirrors are really, there's like an isogeny between them. So it tells you exactly the, the relationship between the parameters. So there, there's one example where we could sit down and do that right now. Um, and maybe for the surfaces, it's not so bad either. There's some birational map that explicitly characterizes them. I don't think that that's so you mean so right, but really even for elliptic curves, it's a little bit trickier than what you're thinking, John. Um, because we have, uh, so this mirror construction says on this side we have smooth cubics in P3, and on the other side we, we have And so there are certain um, 
cubics in P3 that very clearly map onto elements of this pencil, namely the ones that are of the form x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed minus 3 psi x y z. Wait, sorry, are you talking um, about cubic surfaces or cubic curves? I mean, is this elliptic curves or? Uh, yeah, yeah. So these, oh, sorry, I wrote P3. I mean, 